Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Lou from AdriftInTokyo.com and welcome to our vlog number four. I'm going to be talking about our question and answer section. I got a few questions, this is our first Q&A, and I'd like to take a few moments to talk about it and give you some insight on my decision process, what I was going through at the time, and help you with that. So, first question that I got from someone via email was, if you had a chance to work overseas before with your company, why didn't you just stay with them and find a job in Japan? That's a pretty good question. And for, a few, for those of you who don't know, I worked for about a year after graduating university. I went, to, I went to college for four years. I studied chemical engineering. And I graduated, got a job with a company. It's an international company. They work in the uh, energy sector and they offered me a job within the company out in Singapore, which is as far away as from the east coast of the US as you could possibly go. It's an 18 hour direct flight from New Jersey in the States. And they said, do you want to go to Singapore? I said, sure, I would love to go to Singapore. And so it's, it's a very nice experience if you're into that. They take care of everything. They find you a place to live. And if you have that opportunity, I would strongly recommend it. Now, I spent a lot of time in Singapore. I spent almost four years there. I always wanted to go to Japan, and I tried my best to get out there. But as you probably could guess, it's not you can just request wherever you, it's not the type of job where you can request wherever you want to go. In the business world, it's there's there's a need and or a business need, and management and different folks in the organization try to figure out well. How are we going to meet this need? Who do we get or what do we do to meet this business need? And so in my specific case, there was a business need. We needed somebody in Singapore. We needed somebody with this skill set out in Singapore to work this job. And they said, well, Lou has this skill set. We'll send Lou out there. Now, I got lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. Now, if I push for a job in Singapore, maybe I can get it. If I said I want to go to Singapore, that would have helped. But it was basically because there was a business need and I fit that business need. Now, getting out to Japan, there's two reasons why I wasn't able to get out to Japan within my, within my company. First reason is it's very difficult and it's very expensive to get out to Japan. So what does that mean? That means that the business need needs to be extremely important, extremely uh, lucrative, except whatever word you want to use, in order to justify spending the money and putting the effort into getting somebody out there. We're called expatriates. If you go on an expat assignment, it's very costly. It costs a lot of effort, a lot of resources, a lot of money to put someone out there, find them a place to live, and to support them while they're in another country. Singapore is expensive, but Japan is very expensive. And so, first issue is cost. The, the activation energy for me to get out to Japan with my job was extremely high. I didn't speak the language which made it very difficult as well. Now, you don't have to speak the language to get out there within a, uh, you know, a company as long as you fit the business need. Within our company, we all speak English. So if it was so important to get me out to Japan within my company, then it won't matter if you speak English. I mean, sorry, it won't matter if you speak Japanese. You get the job done, you go out to Japan, you do your job, and then you'll come back eventually. It doesn't matter if you learn Japanese. So it's all about the business need. At the time, I was looking around, when I got back from Singapore, this is back in 2010, I pushed, I pushed very strongly to get out to Japan. I tried to position myself in the different technology areas, forecasting, well, what is going to be the need in Asia, in Japan, and how do I give myself those skills or build those skills so that when the time comes they're looking for someone, I can get out to Japan. So I did that. Two years go by. And then there was a, a public announcement, which pretty, this is reason number two, which pretty much buried my chances of getting out to Japan. Our company divested our majority share of the business in Japan, which basically in layman terms means no more opportunities in Japan. Japan is now another company that we're competing with, and we've got some share of ownership, but you know, not much. And so that also meant no more assignments, no more opportunities, and basically no more Japan. And so I was struggling with getting back from Singapore and getting an assignment out there 
because I wasn't skilled enough, I didn't have the right skills to make the business need strong enough, and then two, we basically sold the business in Japan. So yeah, I would have loved to have an opportunity to work in Japan, I would have loved to be on another expat assignment, but you know, it just sometimes doesn't work out. If you have the opportunity to work overseas, do it. I highly recommend it. It's a great experience. But if you're looking to get out to Japan, it's very, in my opinion, it's very difficult. Unless you open up your own business, or you, you, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful guy who does these podcasts. His, and he does a lot of updates for gaijinpot.com. His, name, uh, his name's Anthony Joe. J-O-H. Very friendly guy. I, I like reading what he has to write. I like watching his videos. I hope to meet him in Tokyo. His work is fantastic. What he talked about was taking, I think he sold an auto business back in Canada. I may be messing up some of the details, but he sold this business and either that financed his ability to move or that made it easier for him to move because then he can work you know, jobs but use that as supplemental income. Whatever way it is, he made it happen in his own way. If you want to make it happen with a company, you can't just say, hey, I love Japan, I want to go out there, I really like the language, I can, I can even speak Japanese, why don't you put me out there? A manager who's either American, European, whatever, they're focused on the business. They don't care, in my opinion, they don't care that you learn, you know Japanese. Do you know what needs to get done for the business to make this venture or this project successful? You can be the most crass, um, overindulgent, um, lack of Japanese knowledge American there is, but if you can get a job done and make the business successful, they're going to put you in Japan. Uh, question number two, why Hitotsubashi? So I touched upon this a little bit in my last, I think my first vlog or one of the first blog posts, but I probably should go over it real quick. Um, back in 2000, 2011, I applied to a number of MBA programs here in the States. I was looking for different programs that were like international in, um, what would you call it? Like there's a lot of study abroad options with an international twist where you can earn a degree at a sister school or something like that. And so I applied to the Harvard Business School. I applied to Chicago Booth in, uh, well, in Chicago. And I applied to the Wharton School in, you know, in, up in Pennsylvania. I didn't get into any of those. Happy to share my experience, but basically the feedback that I got was my essays pretty much communicated the message of, wow, this guy doesn't want to just go to Japan for a semester or to go there for some cultural exchange. He wants to be in Japan. And so none of those schools thought I was a good fit for them with my career goals in mind. So um, it was a good learning experience for me. But then I started looking at other programs. I picked up the copy of The Economist, which is, if you're looking at MBAs, that's probably one of the magazines you've already looked at. But The Economist puts out this magazine called Why an MBA. I think they rank MBAs from one to a hundred on, you know, on the global, uh, you know, global MBA programs, and they tell you which ones they think are the best. Now, it's no, it should come as no surprise that a lot of the MBAs in Asia, not many of them are from Japan. And a lot of this has to do with the marketability, oh sorry, not the marketing, the marketing of these schools and the way Japanese MBAs are viewed, they sometimes don't get the accreditation that's required, there's a lot of other factors. But basically the only MBA in Japan that I found at that time, this is back in 2009, was IUJ, International University of Japan, which is, it's a university in Japan a private university, which is in the northern part of, uh, of the main island, Honshu, uh, in Niigata, N-I-I-G-A-T-A. -I -I Wonderful place for sake and uh, fish. Uh, they have great rice up there. And they happen to have, uh, just south of Niigata itself, there's a uh, university up in the mountains. Um, one of the famous mountains up there is uh, uh, Hakai-san, or Hakai Mountains, which is another good brand of sake if you're interested. So, or Nihonshu. And so this university, I found out through The Economist, I was still working at the time. I said, you know what, yeah, this looks really interesting. I did some research, they said they had a lot of great scholarship opportunities, so I said, oh, I'll look into that. And so I applied, I got a half scholarship, and um, I thought it was a good opportunity, but I said, you know, I need to really see the campus. So 
So I went out there. It's a long ride from Tokyo. It's about a two hour bullet train or Shinkansen ride. And I got out to Tokyo, I'm oh, sorry, I got out to the campus. People are friendly, wonderful area, but it just, it seemed too isolated and it seemed like I would be spending a lot for a degree that I don't know if it would have been a great experience. The people there were great, as I mentioned, but I wanted to be in a city. I wanted to be experiencing the, the hustle and bustle to maybe reach out and network with different companies, to talk with different people in my class in the different neighborhoods, all that good stuff. And it just didn't feel right. I visited the campus actually twice because I had a follow-up business trip through Japan before the divestment. And I went out there and I still, nothing, nothing really clicked. Again, wonderful people. I really like the campus, it's beautiful, but it just wasn't the place I wanted to be. So I didn't accept the offer. I said, you know, what am I going to do now? I'm, I'm, I'm basically spinning my wheels. It's going to be 2011, 2012 before I know it. Well, sorry, it's going to be 2012 before I know it. And well, I haven't even picked a place to go to school. And that's where I landed upon three universities in Japan that offered an English teaching program and said, you know, you can come uh, here, do the English program, you get a high quality MBA. These are recognized schools in Japan. Um, I landed on Hitotsubashi, Waseda, and Doshisha, which is in Kyoto. Waseda and um, Hitotsubashi are in Tokyo, and Doshisha is in Kyoto. And all three of them, I would say Waseda and Hitotsubashi consistently got higher rankings in the message boards and research that I did. And Doshisha, which is relatively new in Japan, um, that got slightly lower rankings, but I attribute that a lot to it's it's a you know relatively new kid on the block type uh, feel, and so I talked to people from the different universities. I got a good feel of what they were all about, but I got to tell you, the biggest factor for me on uh, which school I wanted to go to. Now you can say Hitotsubashi is cheaper, which it is. Waseda and and Doshisha are very expensive compared to Hitotsubashi. Hitotsubashi is a public university. Both Waseda and Doshisha are private universities, but when I went through the interviewing process, I was most impressed with Hitotsubashi's ability to speak as if I were interacting with a customer or my manager at work. These people, the professors, during the interview really impressed me. Now, not to say I wasn't impressed by the folks at Doshisha and Waseda, but I really felt something click inside for me when I spoke to the folks at Hitotsubashi. They spoke my language, I got a good vibe from them, and I was very impressed with what they were offering in terms of an education. And so it just so happened that that also married very well with the opportunity for a uh, lower cost of education, being in central Tokyo, and things kind of just clicked after that. You know, I don't, I'm not very superstitious, I'm not, I'm not, I don't like talk about um, you know, what's the word, uh, you know, destiny or anything like that. But I really think that this was the right, uh, right call for me because after I got accepted, the, the thing started rolling with the next scholarship and it got, it, it just took off from there. And so that's why I chose Hitotsubashi University. I, I looked at other universities, four other ones in Japan, sorry, three other ones in Japan and three other ones outside of Japan. And I, I dwindled, I, I whittled down the list all the way to Hitotsubashi. Now, there are other universities in, in Japan that teach English uh, as part of the MBA curriculum, but I wasn't very interested, not to say that they're bad programs, but uh, I just didn't know enough about them and I didn't do any more research. So they're probably okay, but in my specific case, that's what I went for. So if you have any more questions about Hitotsubashi, why I chose it, I'll be jumping into them a little bit more as I get to the university, but that was my thought process. So. Please send me your questions. We'll have another Q&A in a couple of weeks or so. But thank you very much. And send me, so yeah, send me more of your questions. I'll jump into them as well. Have a good day, everyone. See you later.